Welcome to the St. Paul Center's Quarantined Catholic Hub. I am Rob Corzine and I am joined by Mike Aquilina, the Vice, Executive Vice President of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, to talk about a book that he did with us at Emmaus Road Publishing a little while back, Villains of the Early Church and How They Made Us Better Christians. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me, Rob. <laughs> this is a, an odd idea for a book, I thought, when I first saw the proposal. Like, Mike, you're usually the church father's guy, talking about the good guys of the early church. Why a book on the bad guys? Well, it was the flip side of all the books about good guys. You know, one thing that I kept running into whenever I wrote about the church fathers was that all of these great heroes were made, really, by villains. You know, they, they, a lot of them weren't looking for ways to be great. They were provoked to greatness because of the villainy of these, these nemeses, these, these nasty men who were, who were uh, either persecutors or heretics or, or just mischief makers. They were provoked into action. And so this, this, uh, this guy in Alexandria, who's the secretary to the bishop, becomes St. Athanasius the Great. You know, uh, right. because he has a, a villain who provokes him to it. Well, it's really a who's who of um, of the baddies of the early church history. Starting in the Bible, we have Judas and Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate and the arch heretic Simon Magus and Nero, and then on into the heresy arcs, Marcion and Valentinus and Celsus. One on this list that I think we may touch on earlier seems to stick out as maybe not entirely a villain, uh, Origen, yes. and uh, Diocletian, and Arius, and Julian, and Nestorius. And I think uh, one of the things that really emerged for me as I, as I read the book is how God writes straight with even very crooked lines. Romans uh, 8.28, right? All things work together for good to them who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. And it turns out that not even just general circumstances, but great evils work out for good. As Joseph said to his brothers, right, in Genesis 50, you intended this for evil, but God meant it for good. And yeah. uh, that was a continuing theme, I think, of, uh, of this book, the way that those who meant to do the church harm ended up doing her great good. Yes, that's true. And even, you know, that, that theme was an important uh, theme for the fathers who, who fought the heretics and who fought the persecutors. It comes up in Tertullian. It also comes up in Augustine. So, so you, you know, early on in the church's history, you have Tertullian saying, in this way, even as the arguments of the opposing party are destroyed, our own explanations are being built up. So we have the heretics challenging the doctrine of Christianity or perverting it or twisting it. And then you have the church moved to clarity, to grow deeper in its own doctrine, to put, to, to put, put a little bit better light on it, and to, to get the word out there in a more effective way. It's because of the heresies that we need to drive home the doctrine uh, in, in, in this way, with the kind of clarity and power that the church fathers did when they delivered it. Mm. The other thing that, uh, that I, I wish you'd talk about for just a moment is you know, this book is so carefully researched and you're using history and you're using church fathers, but then you're also using um, legends of, <laughs> of the early church. Um, and, uh, and, and not, not in a, a simplistic way. No. What, is the, what is the real juice out of using some of those legends? Well, the legends tell us what ordinary Christians were thinking about the whole episode, whether it's a biblical episode or, or an episode in later history. What were ordinary Christians thinking about this? How were they, they working it through in their heads? Because, I, I mean, there's a great enigma here. Some of these, these, these villains, these heretics, they had such great gifts and yet they perverted them in these, these terrible ways. What happened? What happened? And then, of course, you know, you want to believe that God's mercy can reach anyone. And so they would try to imagine 
the ways that God reached out to even the most vile characters in, in Christian history. Yeah, I thought that was beautiful. The, the way that um, Christian writers looking at even some of the worst characters in church history, some of the greatest disasters, Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate and even Nero, you know, would find some way to write Christian fan fiction that, uh, <laughs> that looked at the kind of universe we live in where infinite mercy is offered to the worst of the worst and where the greatest sin that humanity ever committed we call Good Friday. Oh, and, yes. Uh, yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was brilliant. It's the, not that they're recording history, but they're, they're very carefully historically recording, you know, that Christian attitude that oftentimes I think we've lost. Because in some of these legends, in some of these novels, you find, you know, the story of the conversion of Pontius Pilate. And it's a very slow process, actually, of conversion in his, in his life. Now, we don't know. Maybe something like this did happen in the life of Pontius Pilate. Uh, if my God is the kind of God who would pull something off exactly like that. You know, but he's not the only character. As you point out, Caiaphas, you know, we find in certain legends of, of, the, of, of, of later on in history, Caiaphas himself becoming an evangelist uh, for, for the Christian message. Uh, we find the stories of, of Jesus reaching out again and again to Judas, and Judas just cannot accept God's mercy. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the, he is one character who just boggled the Christian imagination. They kept wanting to imagine that overwhelming, overpowering mercy, but they felt compelled to, to keep on stressing human freedom there. Hmm. There are so many great stories here, and uh, one of them, uh, one of the th the other themes that maybe you could talk about is the way that the that over and over again the um, the Christian Church seems outgunned, uh, <laughs> you up up against enemies that they're humanly speaking not equipped to deal with. Absolutely. This happens again and again in history. You know, very early on, it happened with the, the great heretic Marcion, all right? And Marcion was like the George Steinbrenner of his time. I don't know if you're old enough to remember George Steinbrenner, but, but I do. You know, when he, he was a, a, a shipping magnate, he was a great shipbuilder, and, uh, and he had a lot of money, and he bought the Yankees, and he bought a lot of World Series. He bought dominance in, the, in Major League Baseball of his time. Well, Marcion was a shipping magnate. He was a shipbuilder, and he moved to the capital city with all that money, and he was going to do for the church what George Steinbrenner would eventually do for baseball, right? He was going to come to dominate the church with his heresy, and he had some flaky ideas that the God of the Old Testament was not the same God as the God of the New Testament, that the God of the Old Testament was a wicked creator who trapped spirit and matter. And the God of the New Testament, you know, sent Jesus to, to release us from this trap. Marcion had all kinds of crazy ideas, and he edited his own New Testament to, to uh, reflect those ideas. He had money. We were up against serious money. If you go before Marcion with Nero, he had all the power in the world. He really did. He was ruling the world, and he was persecuting the Christians. How do you beat that? The odds are all against you. You know, you go forward in history and you have someone like Valentinus who was the smartest guy in the room wherever he went. And he was the cool guy too, because, because he was the darling of the wealthy classes and they wanted to be like him. They wanted to give him money. They wanted to invite him into their cocktail parties. These are all the people who have everything according to worldly standards. How are the Christians supposed to overcome these odds? And you know what? We overcame the odds in every circumstance, and, and these people now are just footnotes to history. They're footnotes to the development of doctrine, because, because really, all they did was spur the great fathers, the great saints on to greater things, to, 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 uh, to counteract uh, the poisons that these people were trying to deliver 
to the world. So we can overcome the money of Marcion. We can overcome the power of Nero. We can overcome even the cool of Valentinus. And we can, we can overcome it in such a forceful way with God's grace that, that it just overwhelms it. And, and, and you don't even remember these names anymore. I remember them because I'm a nerd. If I walk to any house on my block, I can practically guarantee you that no one knows the name of Marcion. Right, or Valentinus. <laughs> right, even <laughs> less, right. Yeah, in some ways, you know, up against the greatest possible you know, money and power and cool and intelligence, the, the, um, the promise of our Lord is just consistently, you know, in this world you'll have persecution, but don't be afraid, I have overcome the world. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So there are there are two of them. There's there's so many great stories, and people should get the book or or get the um, or get the audio book. That was uh, that was the one of the hardest to record audio books we've ever done because we just kept cracking up. <laughs> I remember especially the chapters on Nero and the chapter on Nestorius that 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 I just could not stop laughing as I was doing the doing the reading. <laughs> well. Really quickly, let's. Um, could you answer why you included Origen in in this list and how he, in some ways, stands out? Well, I included him because some of the fathers considered him to be a great villain and to have introduced a lot of confusion into the world of biblical interpretation. Uh, the Saint Jerome, for example, was a great disciple of Origen later in life, and then turned on him with a vehemence later in life and then you have you have um you have you have other fathers uh epiphanius turning on origin uh and and there are councils who condemned uh, you know that condemned origin so you have to account for this that origin uh, really became a uh, a villain for these these later fathers because of the way his doctrine was used mm. now Fast forward 2,000 years, and you have sober voices like Pope Benedict XVI, Pope John Paul II, reevaluating the life of Origen and the doctrine of Origen and saying, yes, he was seriously confused on certain points, but he always had goodwill. He always said, look, what I'm giving you now is speculation. I'm the first speculative theologian in history, but right. what I'm giving you now is 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 my speculation whenever it seems to counteract the uh the or contradict the doctrine of the church always go with the doctrine of the catholic church he loved that phrase the catholic church go with the doctrine of the catholic church and so so he he really did himself plant the seeds of his own uh, restoration much later. So we had a great movement in scholarship of origin by some, some wonderful, wonderful voices of the 20th century, like Jean Danielou um, and Henri de Lubac and Hans, Hans Urs von Balthasar. But then, uh, of course, the papal confirmation of it was in uh, the, the, the reigns of Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. So even when he teaches what we know to be error uh, or heresy. He does so before it's defined and with full submission of everything he teaches to the church. Yes, like, avoid, he had goodwill. Heresy isn't hard. You just have to submit to the church. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that was the difference between him and Nestorius, in my opinion, that later on you have this figure of Nestorius, who was a smart guy and, and a man of great outward piety, uh, and, and, you know, a man who had been formed in monasteries where he was probably always the smartest guy in the room and then mm -hmm. kind of thrust onto the world stage as, as patriarch of Constantinople. Um, but there you have a guy who believed that his logic was superior to the course of tradition, you know, the weight of tradition, and that his logic trumped the piety of the church that he had received from all of the ancestors. He really try, did try to upset that that uh, that 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 freight of tradition that we'd received from all the centuries before, and and really push against the hierarchy of his time, the other bishops in the church, and also um, against a council eventually. So so yeah, there there there's a way to do it and a way not to do it.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he enters office saying, I'm going to be the, the hammer of error. You know, Pulcaria, you're, you're not allowed to receive communion here. And we're going after that, <laughs> that Arian uh, chapel here in Constantinople. And he ended up by history on the, on the other side of that equation. Yes, yes. Yes, but you know, pride is is our great enemy, and that's a, that's the that's the story for all of us. Not only people who are brilliant theologians and philosophers and that sort of thing, or people who are powerful. Pride is the great enemy for all of us. So we have to we have to keep a a, a good self knowledge, make that examination of conscience every day, know who we are, know where we are in the spiritual life and in the grand scheme of things, and then go forward with the confidence that God will make up. For, for our mistakes if we're sticking with him. Indeed. Could you spend, as we're just running low on time, could you spend just a minute talking about um, Julian, who I think is the, the most Christian persecutor of the Christians? Oh my, yes. Well, Julian was an ex-Christian. He had been raised as a Christian, but he was raised in the imperial family. And that's really a misfortune for anyone who has it, right? Uh, because uh, because the imperial family is is just subject to all kinds of plots and divisions and schemes that are going on within the, the family itself, within the household of the emperor. And so Julian, when he was a small child, um, saw the emperors, the, the very Christian emperors, as he liked to remind us, um, he saw those emperors order the massacre of all of his close relations. Um, his father, his uncles, his cousins, suddenly just wiped out because the very Christian emperors wanted no rivals for the throne. Mm. So they eliminated them in the simplest and most complete way. Uh, Julian somehow survived because he was a small child and considered no great threat. Eventually, he does find his way to the throne and he initiates a soft persecution. He wants to he doesn't want to make martyrs because he knows that martyrs only cause the growth within the church. So what he does is, is try to eliminate Christians through legislation from the public square, from any public influence, eliminate them from the practice of the law, from the practice of government, from the practice of education, so they can no longer make more influential Christians for the next generation, so that they can no longer exercise any kind of power over the minds of the people. Um, and he succeeded to a rather remarkable degree in doing this. At the same time, he tried to revive paganism. The problem is that nobody wanted to be a pagan, even with the emperor behind the movement and all of his money kind of pouring into it, Nobody wanted to be a pagan, and it was kind of a pathetic thing watching Julian try to revive this. And how did he revive it? Well, he knew it wasn't going to revive as what it had been before in the classical era. You know, it was, it, it was too much of a riot of different cults and sects back then. He was going to revive it as a unified system. So he made it a mirror image of the Catholic Church. He made it a hierarchy with himself as Pope and then an order of bishops, and then an order of priests and deacons below that. And he tried even to imitate the church in its charity. He tried to, to organize uh, charitable institutions to feed the poor and to heal the sick. <laughs> it still didn't get anywhere because you cannot pay people enough to be chari charitable. You cannot pay people enough to, to risk their lives caring for the sick in a time of epidemic. Nobody wants to do that. They say, isn't that what I'm paying taxes for? Why are you asking me to do this? So, so Julian's project was not getting off the ground. And, and there goes my cell phone, and I don't even know how to shut it off. Hold on. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really interesting example where the, um, the state tries to subsidize something that the church is already doing for free. And yes. Without you, you can't hire people to love you. 
you have uh, you, you have to understand that these institutions of charity had never existed before. The church invented these things. There were never almshouses. There were never orphanages. There were never hospitals before Christianity got around to establishing these things. You, again, you cannot make these things with money, and you, ne you cannot force people to love in the ways they need to love in order to keep these institutions going. Uh, Julian never lived to see that happen because he, he died three years into his, his reign. His reign was mercifully short. Mm. And uh, I love the, the note at the very end of the book, and maybe we should, we should end on this. It, uh, you know, our, our Lord takes to himself the, um, the words of the, the psalmist, right? He is the Messiah. And so, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And sometimes he does that to our enemies, but sometimes instead of making them our footstool, he makes them our friends. And, uh, and so we, uh, we have great confidence from the history of the church that, um, that will always be helped, but, uh, but it'll always be in a surprising way. Yeah, the great thing about, um, about the first evangelization that took place in the world was that it happened through the making of friends. That's how Christianity spread, and that's how the world was converted. And every crisis gives us an opportunity to relive that moment, to call upon the same grace, and to do it all over again. Mm. Well, that leads us into probably what we should make a, a separate conversation, because you've got a book coming out soon on the subject of uh, friendship in the early church. So I do. Ease people with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up so for that conversation. Spending some time this afternoon. It's good to see you, even from a distance. <laughs> good to see you too, Rob.